Hi there, my name is Mike Affelberg. I am the host of the TV show Living United with Nashua Business. This show is about bringing the businesses in our community together to talk about philanthropy, talk a little bit about what they do and how they uplift our community, make Greater Nashua a place which is stronger, smarter, safer, healthier, and happier for all of us who live here. So today I'm very excited to have with me in the studio, Kristen Fox. Kristen is a palliative care nurse at St. Joseph Hospital. And we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the programming they do over there in her field, as well as some of the ways in which we partner with St. Joseph Hospital throughout the year. So Kristen, welcome to our show today. Glad to have you with us. Thank you, Mike. It's great to be here. It is great to be here. And I have to say, first of all, um, thank you to you at St. Joseph Hospital. I'll talk a little bit more at later in the show about all the great ways in which we partner together, but I'm sure you're aware of some of that, and maybe not even all of it. Probably so. not all. Uh, but you guys are terrific partners of ours and uh, with many other organizations in the community. So Kristen, you're a palliative care nurse. Let's start out with just a basic description of what that actually means. Since sure. Many of us have heard about this, but probably don't know exactly what that is. Sure. So palliative care is care of patients who have illnesses that may be going through treatment and need some help managing the side effects of the treatment or the disease um, to understand what their goals of care are, to understand what their disease is and what the treatments can and cannot do for them, um, to help them with their advanced care planning needs Mm -hmm. to involve their families in discussions about what their future holds and to understand what matters most to them in regards to their health care. So are we talking mostly about pain management or a wide variety of other types of things? Lots of things, lots of symptoms. Um, pain is one of them, but yeah. we deal with things like nausea, shortness of breath. Um, I can't walk as good as I used to be able to walk. Um, emotional distress. We deal with a lot of social issues. Um, I can't live where I used to live. Mm -hmm. um, we deal with a lot of family dynamic type of situations. We have a great collaboration with our care coordination team at the hospital, uh, our social workers at the hospital, and our spiritual care department. So I'm guessing that what we're really talking about is end of life planning uh, in a lot of cases. So that's definitely part of our goal mm -hmm. with patients. Palliative care came from hospice care, which started in this country in Connecticut in the yeah. 70s. Okay. Um, but palliative care is as big as our room that we're sitting in, and hospice is as big as this table. So when patients are coming to the end of their life, yeah. if they've had a good relationship with their palliative care team, we can help them come to the end of their life in a comfortable way. That's, that's really so important. I mean, I can share with you, um, as we talked earlier, before we started taping the show, I've had, unfortunately, several instances in my recent life where I've had to um, you know, work with and support my, my relatives at the end of their lives. Um, one who recently passed away in June, uh, my aunt who passed away, she had cancer and ended up, um, I was her like her person for all of this. So I know that there's programs that you're running that help families to do some of the planning that, that is necessary um, when a patient is is sort of reaching the end of their lives. Tell, tell me about that program a little right. bit. Right, so I'm doing a lecture right now that's called, um, my parents are getting older, what do I need to know? And we talk a lot about the advanced directive process that's planning for who's the person who is your person mm -hmm. who can talk for you when you can't talk for yourself? Um, only really in regards to health care. Um, and we talk right. about living wills. Mm -hmm. um, we talk about code status, CPR and intubation and those types of things. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times during those lectures, things come up about regular wills, um, parents' ability to drive, Mm -hmm. um, where they are. A lot of times there are children in our area and how do they get involved with parents who are in Florida, for example. Yep. Um, they they want to know a lot of things about how to take care of their parents, and but they're kind of surprised that this has happened all of a sudden. It's, it, when it happens, it's, um, it is a surprise. 
I will say that I think nobody tells you really how hard it is to be uh, in your 50s. And um, because that's really, for most of us, when we start to um, lose people and there's no real training program for this or nobody prepares you for this. It sounds like that's what you're doing. I'm trying to help people understand um, our parents do get older and we need to try to help them. They've always helped us. Mm -hmm. I took care of my parents and I know my dad would say, oh, I don't want you to do this for me. And I would say, dad, you raised me up. You brought me up to this point in my life and helped me be successful. And now it's my turn to help you. Um, And I think a lot of people feel that way, but we get involved in our lives, our kids' lives, and all of a sudden we realize mom's really holding on to the table to walk across the room. Right. Um, We talk a lot about dementia uh, Mm -hmm. because sometimes we don't notice that parents are forgetting things. Um, I try to help people realize what's going on with their parents and get them to the resources that they need to help them. So some of the more common things, which I think I'd like to just touch upon, you mentioned driving. Mm. How big of an issue is this that you come across? I can tell you the two instances that I've, well, actually, now that I think about it, almost everybody that I've had, my father had um, ALS and then passed away. And for him, driving was a big deal and stopping driving was a big deal. My father-in-law had Parkinson's and for him to stop driving at the end of his life was very tough. Um, Both of these guys were, you know, they were guys that had a lot of pride and were family men and had taken care of, you know, their job was to take care of, not to be taken care of. Yeah. And, um, and then I had it with the same with my mother and my aunt, the, the drive, the driving thing's a big deal. It's a big, it's a huge deal. How do you go about talking about this with people? (laughs) It's tough. Yeah. Uh, it's tough. It's a, it's a independence (laughs) thing. Right. It's a, a freedom thing. I, I have three 16-year-olds right now that are chomping at the bit to get out and be free yeah. and be able to go. And it's a very difficult thing. Um, we have conversations. Um, a lot of times patients are on medications that make it very difficult for them to yeah. uh, drive. They also have disease processes Parkinson's being Mm -hmm. one of them that make their reaction times less. Um, So we talk about not wanting to injure other people along with themselves. Mm -hmm. Um, When they come with their family member to the appointments and we hear about um, driving through the garage door, uh, banging into things, we just have kind of an honest conversation about it and try to encourage them not to drive when it's unsafe for them. Um, I know that my, when my daughter years ago visited my mother in California and my mom, my mother had cancer um, and she was pretty with it till pretty close to the very end. Mm-hmm. But uh, one day she was driving with my daughter. My daughter was there visiting by herself. She was, she had a driver's license already and she looks over there and they're in a intersection and she looks over and grandma's falling asleep. Yeah. At, in the intersection, <laughs> and she's like, Grandma, Grandma. And that was the time when we realized it's maybe time to start talking about driving. A lot of times if we're prescribing yeah. medications for pain right, um, or anxiety or things like that, we also tell patients that they really should not be driving with those types of medications. Yeah. So that is another opportunity to try to bring things in where they're not driving. Well, it maybe gets them off the hook a little gets bit, too. Gets them off too, the hook, right. Because they have something like, else there's a to good bring. reason mm-hmm. now. Yep. It's not just personal or where you're at. There's also like there's this thing. Right. We're all taught with the idea, brought up with the idea of, you know, don't drink and drive, don't take medications, don't operate heavy sh- machinery. Right. So that's that's actually kind of a good tactic, I think. It works sometimes. Yeah. One thing I've noticed, um, and I'm guessing I'd love your perspective on this, too, is that the people who I've, um, where I've experienced end of life with, it, there seems to be an impulse to give away stuff. Mm-hmm. Make sure that the things I have that are meaningful to me end up um, somewhere that I know they'll be taken care of. And so like, if this is my hat and, and I'm thinking, my time is near. I'm going to be like, Kristen, this is my hat. I want to make sure that you have a hat. But you 
will feel very uncomfortable with this conversation. Mm -hmm. People feel, I think, kind of like, no, it's okay. Like, I don't want to talk with you about that because it feels almost like, I don't know, it's just a strange feeling. Sometimes I yeah. have actually the opposite experience with that. So when I'm trying to have someone do their advanced directives, men in particular get a little hesitant to sign anything because they feel like they're signing away things and their okay. ability to keep control over their stuff. So we have a lot of conversations about that. I have several patients that have mm -hmm. um, started to do things like clean out their houses and pack mm -hmm. things up because I don't want anybody to have to worry about taking care of those things. Um, and when the, Oh, sure. Not wanting yeah, to be a burden. Not wanting to be a burden. Mm -hmm. um, they are slimming down their houses, getting things kind of ready. They're not close to the end of their life, but they have a very advanced illness that mm -hmm. we're treating, but they know what's potentially going to happen. So they're trying to get things narrowed down. And when the families come in and they say, you know, we have those exact conversations. Well, I know that um, I'm going to give you this ring and the daughters are going, but mom, I don't want to talk about that. Yeah. I say to them, you know, that makes your mom feel really happy to know that, I'm, that she's going to give you that ring. It, it took me through two or three people to realize that what, what you're really doing is giving that person a gift. You're Correct. giving them a gift because then they now have the feeling, I think they have the feeling that um, they're not gonna be forgotten. That's right. And you, you, you kind of can, you kind of convey yourself through your stuff because you're not gonna be around anymore. Right, right. But and it's they very- They feel relieved that they're yeah. with you in some yeah. way. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> have a small family, I will say, and I'm the end of the line for most of my family. Mm -hmm. So I've found myself with a, a very eclectic mix of things, <laughs> <laughs> in particular clocks. <laughs> Something about my, I have like a, a clock for my parents, a clock for my aunt, a clock for my uncle, a grandfather clock for my uncle. My wife's like, I, we can't wind all these things at the same time. It sounds terrible in here. <laughs> but, uh, so the things are very interesting. Um, by the same token, I have found that there's a lot of resistance. You said control. There's a lot of resistance to, um, let's say, your person who's going to be taking care of things in the end. Maybe um, you need to have them on your financials, mm. co-signing on your accounts, mm. you know, um, be able to speak for you for to Medicare, Social Security. All of these um, things are like really important. And, um, but there's a lot of resistance to, to, to having those conversations. There is. That's a, another very um, difficult thing for people to kind of let go. They don't want to not have the information. Just before I came over here, I had this exact conversation mm. with the gentleman. Um, his wife is going home on hospice. He's a little demented. He needs some help with his bills and whatnot. And I said, well, we have a social worker who can help you with that. Mm -hmm. I don't want her to take everything from me. I don't want her to open mm -hmm. all my mail. Um, and it's really important for somebody to have that access so that when the checks come in from Social Security, mm. when the um, bills need to be paid and there's nobody available to pay them, somebody can sign those things. Yeah. Um, there is sometimes a little bit of concern about who that person is and how that can affect mm. their finances. So that really needs to be done with some uh, good forethought and advice. Yeah. Yeah, no, there's no question about that. Mm -hmm. With my, I know with my aunt, I, I um, had arranged with her that, well, it never really worked actually, but <laughs> we had this sort of inbox, outbox, in process, mm -hmm. different couple piles in her in her place. And uh, the mail, it would come in, it would, she would put it, in theory, on the inbox. But I would come in, and it would be all opened up and in different piles mm -hmm. all over. I'd be like, come on, Bobby, really? How am I <laughs> supposed to help you? you got to help me to help you a little bit here. It was funny. When my mom mm -hmm. was, um, she had had a stroke, and yeah. she couldn't write the checks anymore. She could still tell me things. Um, and I said, well, does Dad want to help you? And he just never was able to do the finances at all. So... I was able to take care of it for her, but he would open all the mail. I'd find things weeks and weeks yeah. later. 
it, it was difficult. It was, I also found the loan that she gave my brother. <laughs> mm -hmm. Fun things. Yeah, uh, absol absolutely. Um, so what are some of the things that perhaps people don't think about? Um, let's start with the patient side. Um, so they don't think about needing help. Um, they don't think about how um, their disease is going to affect them. They, a lot of patients don't realize that a disease process like heart failure or COPD get worse over time and what that means. Mm -hmm. um, they don't um, realize that they are going to need help and how they need to go about getting that help. Mm -hmm. um, Families don't understand that um, they need to participate in helping with that person, um, whether it's, you know, coming over to the house once a week and checking the expiration dates on food in the refrigerator and really mm. looking at mom's <laughs> clothes. Are they clean, you know? <laughs> I have to laugh. Everything you've said is like so true. Right. And I'm, I'm really absolutely right about that. You the know? food in the refrigerator, that's a big deal too. Right. Um, how does, how's their house set up? Yeah. Where's the laundry? Are there area rugs that they're going to be able to trip over? Right. Um, who's going to shovel the <clears throat> snow? Uh, you know, in a way, it's kind of like starting over with a baby. It you is. Gotta, you got to baby proof your house for your parents. Right. Uh, our friend, uh, Dr. McDonough would often say, mm -hmm. you know, when you bring somebody home from the hospital who's older, mm -hmm. it's like bringing home a new baby. You mm -hmm. have to really rethink how you do everything right. with them. Right. Um, and where are they going to live if they couldn't take care of themselves anymore? Mm -hmm. um, we don't think about those kinds of things. Um, yeah, it's absolutely true. We really do not, and nobody really preps us for it no. either. So the program that you're um, running at the hospital, is this open to uh, patients from th anybody th from throughout the community? Right, anybody. So. We have, um, at St. Joe's, we have a palliative care program. Yeah. We see patients on the inpatient side and we see patients on the outpatient side. Uh, primary care docs can refer their patients. Patients can ask to be seen. The lectures that I give are advertised th uh, through St. Joe's. Mm -hmm. I just did one at the YMCA. Um, Wonderful. There'll be more coming. Um, I believe there'll be one in the spring. Um, and we have care coordinators at our hospital who are available, um, you know, call in and we can get an appointment to have um, advanced directives completed and have some of those yeah. conversations done. Um, our care coordinators in the primary care practices are very good at kind of helping people who are struggling get rooted in the right direction for whatever level of services they need. If people are feeling like they need you, uh, visiting nurses at home, they are able to work with their primary care docs and get those orders in place and get the right agency to help them with that type of thing. We I think one of the hardest conversations overall that you can have with somebody is about um, an advanced directive and a DNR. Yeah. Um, but not all DNRs are the same. Not all do not resuscitates are the same. So how? what are some of the questions that you would ask somebody to consider when thinking about a do not resuscitate uh, directive. Right. So I start off um, my conversations about asking people what they know about a DNR. Mm -hmm. um, and in my world, I'd like to think all DNR is the same, but I know that patients like to kind of pick and choose what they want to know, but I try to relate it to their disease process. Okay. So specifically for um, somebody who is um, a CHF patient or a heart disease mm -hmm. patient, um, s resuscitating their heart may not bring them back to where they're at. Right. Um, depending on the type of person they are, if I get an engineer, sometimes they like statistics. So I might tell them that doing in-hospital yeah. CPR does not bring you back and what the percentage of case that is for that type of <laughs> right. I only care. want to be resuscitated if I have a 28.3% oh, probability. Right. Correct, yep. Yes. They, um, they really Understood. have very specific things. And then they yeah. will say, well, I, I want you to do CPR, but I don't want you to intubate me, which kind of goes 
um, one doesn't really happen without the other. Well, CPR without intubation is likely to be pretty ineffective. Correct. I think the other thing people sometimes don't think about is that CPR can be something can really mess you up. Right. So I like, I often will say it's not like it looks on Gray's Anatomy. Yeah. It's very traumatic. Um, the compression is very, um, we have to go pretty deep. You and come back with cr cracked ribs. Cracked ribs that can injure organs that lay underneath. Mm -hmm. um, the defibrillation process with the uh, defibrillator is can burn and bruise. Uh, we give a lot of medications mm -hmm. and patients um, can have anoxic or lack of oxygen to the brain injury after that. So they don't necessarily come back as good as they look at before right. we start. Um, and when you're on a ventilator, it after a certain amount of time, if we're unable to take you off of the ventilator, we have to talk about things like tracheostomies and feeding right. tubes and all of that. So there's a really big conversation that has to go on. Yeah. Um, in the state of New Hampshire, we also have a form called the POLST, which is Physician Orders for Life-Sustaining Treatments which includes the DNR, but it also has very specific orders about, do you want full treatment? Meaning mm -hmm. CPR, ICU admission, fully treat me with everything you've got, mm -hmm. or limited treatment, bring me back to the hospital, try to avoid ICU, but give me what you got, or comfort focused care, mm -hmm. meaning keep me at home, only transfer to me if my symptoms can't be managed. And then we talk about using IV fluids for a limited time right. or not, feeding tubes um, for a limited time or not, antibiotics if it's contributing to comfort. Um, so we're able to manipulate yeah. um, what a patient really wants and hear what they want. Um, so I think, Kristen, we're almost out of time. I'm going to mm -hmm. say for me, the biggest takeaway about all of this from what you've shared and also from my personal experience is to have these conversations and do this planning before you need it. Correct. Before you need it. Um, because then you're going to, you, your parents, your family member, you're going to have, you're going to be in a place that's more comfortable and more understood Um for all of you, don't don't wait until you're in the hospital to start thinking about this stuff. Yeah. We get caught in crisis mode at the hospital. Yeah. Um, and in my world, I once heard um, someone call it the Thanksgiving table conversation. So mm. this is a timely time to have this conversation. They're not easy conversations to have, maybe not at the Thanksgiving table, um, but it, it's time to have the conversation when you're healthy. Right. You know. I, I, I could not agree with you more. I think that's absolutely, absolutely true. Um, listen, I have a couple things I want to say about St. Joseph Hospital. Sure. Um, first of all, thank you for what you do. Oh, thank you. Um, it is very, very, very important. Um, the hospital has been a partner with United Way for many years mm -hmm. on many levels. And just recently, a couple of those that I wanted to mention, uh, besides the fact that John, your, your, your boss is... Yeah. Uh, um, on our board of directors mm -hmm. and is just a really great counsel to me and to many members of our community. You guys have supported us in various events like our skydiving event. <laughs> um, you probably have some <laughs> colleagues you know who did yeah. that with us. Um, you also are sponsors of our uh, run that we do in the mm -hmm. winter, the Nashua Nor'easter. <laughs> yes. Who comes up with these crazy ideas? I only do only we do. Um, <laughs> And also our Volunteer Greater Nashua portal, which is how volunteers can connect in the community mm -hmm. to different types of volunteering opportunities. We couldn't do any of these things without the support of St. Joe's. So I have to say, we're just really, really grateful for that support. Great. We're honored. Yeah, it's a great partnership. Um, I wanted to also give you a gift oh. because nobody comes on my show without a <laughs> gift. And nobody gets a very good one either. <laughs> so that's uh, a baseball cap you great. can take back. Thank you so much. Make all the people at, uh, at the hospital jealous of I your will. amazing hat. Um, how long have you been doing this work, Kristen? I have been doing palliative care for most of my nursing career, but yeah. I've been a certified palliative care nurse practitioner for 10 years. 
Wow. And all the time at St. Joseph Hospital? I've been at St. Joe's for 10 years as a nurse practitioner, yep. That's great. And your specialty is also in the oncology yeah, area? Yeah, I also I started at St. Joe's in the oncology suite. Um, mm -hmm. I worked with uh, Don McDonough to start yeah. my career. He mentored me in my last year of grad school. Um, and then I um, was able to um, work with our great team there to develop the palliative care program back into uh, existence and um, have been doing this full time for um, almost three years now. Yeah, and you mentioned Doc McDonough, Dr. Don. He's been one of our volunteers for, yeah. gosh, it's gotta be, I don't know, a long time and certainly before me in helping to um, part, participate in the grant making process that yeah. we do. And yeah. He's been a, <laughs> a really great volunteer to do that. Very deliberate, very, um, very uh, deep thinking and um, with a wonderful perspective. Yeah, so, he's great. He, he really is. And so um, I just want to say, again, thank you for coming on the show today, talking about the work you do. It's not easy. I, I don't know if these are Thanksgiving conversations, but these are definitely important family conversations. Right. Thank you so much for having me and let yeah. me talk about what I do and love every day. Absolutely, Kristen. So I'm going to say thank you to everybody for tuning in today. You've been listening to um, another edition of Living United with Nashua Business. We'll be back in a couple weeks with a new episode. I believe I'm going to have GM Roth on at our next episode, um, talking about some of what they're doing and how they're partnering with us as well. Until that time, please remember the golden rule at United Way, which is please be kind to each other because great things really do happen when we live united. <laughs>